thank you guys for watching and enjoy today's video. I'm going to go and eat this now. Bye bye everybody! I mean that sausage did look alright but I really feel like I could do better. Uh, that chef was pretty bad to be honest. From the look of that I'd give it about a 6 out of 10. You know, not the best. Excuse me! 6 out of 10 for my sausage recipe! You've got some explaining to do! How the hell did you get in here? Yes Dorco, it's me. Chef Dorco, didn't expect me to show up, did you? Giving me a 6 out of 10? Okay, yes, yes, okay. I mean, you look like me. You sound like me. What the heck is this multiverse HelloFresh crossover? Look, let's cut that out. You don't need to know how I got here. The multiverse is extremely complicated, okay? When sponsorships come along in the universe by the wonderful HelloFresh, it happens, okay? I end up here. You came through the multiverse just to get upset at me because I gave your food a 6 out of 10. Look, I really can't forgive you for that, okay? But let's just put it behind us for a second. I've just appeared randomly inside your house. And the only way, unfortunately, that I'm going to get sent home is for you to talk about the wonderful HelloFresh. Can you do that for me? Please. The things I do for sponsorships. Let me turn on the voiceover real quick. There we go. Okay, let's do this. As you guys know from the first HelloFresh sponsorship, HelloFresh is absolutely fantastic. With 50 weekly options for food, including a rotating selection of items at HelloFresh Market, there are plenty of amazing dishes to choose from no matter the occasion. HelloFresh offers so many recipes to choose from each week, so you'll never end up in a recipe rut. HelloFresh has options for everyone, including family-friendly, fit and wholesome, and quick and easy meals. So there's something to please even the pickiest eater at your table, even if that's you. Mix up mealtime by learning a new skill, whether that's solo, with a partner, or with your family. The step-by-step -step recipes are so easy to make, even for kids helping hands to pitch in. Don't waste money on foods you don't need. All HelloFresh recipes come with pre-portioned ingredients to make sure you have just the right amount for each recipe. And for four years, I've been cooking all the time as well, so my cooking skills have improved. It's always healthy and good for you, and it makes me feel great. If you're interested in trying it out, use the link in the description or go to HelloFresh.com and use code POGDORCO16 for up to 16 free meals and free surprise gifts across six HelloFresh boxes plus free shipping. And there you have it, guys. Thank you so much for HelloFresh again for sponsoring today's video. I really do appreciate it. Was, was that okay, Chef Dorco? Okay. Well, thank you so much for watching, guys, and please enjoy today's video. Bye. What's going on, guys? Dorco back again. Hope you are fantastic today. And welcome back to another Fazbear Fright Summary. We are still on Friendly Face, and we're on the last story now. Together. Forever. Like, uh, to be fair, guys, you know what? This book has not been bad at all. I think these three stories have all been pretty good. You know, Friendly Face was good. Sea Bonnies was good, too. But I'm going to say, Together Forever is probably the darkest one out of all three. And it's up there for the most, like, darkest, gruesome uh, stories in the whole of Fazbear Frights. Like, seriously. Um, it involves a springlock suit and uh, somebody getting springlocked. And it goes into detail at how vicious and... Uh, powerful these spring locks can be, man. Like, they're really bad. So, yeah, we're going to get straight into it, guys. Like I said, really good story. Together forever. Jessica and Brittany are the two main characters in this story. If any of you guys have watched Mean Girls, Jessica and Brittany are basically like the popular girls at school. Uh, Jessica's homecoming queen. Brittany's homecoming princess. Both sound very bratty and privileged. Uh, the prettiest girls in the school. That type of person, right, that you always see. The cliche, the cliche homecoming popular girl who bullies everybody else at, at, the, at the school, right? There's a lot of high school filler in this. Uh, Jessica has a boyfriend and stuff, and Jessica and Brittany are best friends, want to be friends forever. We get introduced by another set of characters, Mindy and Cindy. And these are the younger students who are at the school. And they're the complete opposite to Jessica and Brittany, right? So they're they're not very good looking. Uh, they're very nerdy, uh, very on their own, just those two as friends. And Jessica and Brittany just start to be mean 
uh, to Mindy and Cindy just looking down at them, you know. We're homecoming queen and homecoming princess. Looking down at all the other students. Mindy and Cindy are like in the way of Jessica's locker. Uh, and they have a bit of like... When Jessica and Brittany bully Mindy and Cindy, they don't take it. They don't care. They don't get upset or anything. They're just not bothered. Which makes Jessica and Brittany even more frustrated with them and not liking them. That's going to lead to further consequences later on in the story. So yeah, Jessica and Brittany had presence and beauty. Very, very egotistical. Later on at the school, at the cafeteria, usually... When Jessica and Brittany go into the cafeteria and want to find a seat, the other students get up and move out the way and let them sit where they are because they're the popular girls. You admire them. You look, you look up to them. Uh, so if they want to sit in your seat, you get up and go somewhere else. Again, if you've watched Mean Girls, it's very similar to that. Mindy and Cindy are in the seats that they want to get. And Jessica and Brittany are like, move, you know, the... the, the these are our seats. Get up and move. You don't seem to understand who we are. And Mindy and Cindy, again, don't care. They troll uh, Jessica and Brittany, like, really bad. And but obviously, Jessica and Brittany are just like, you don't know you don't know who you're dealing with. So they start to get really mean back. Um, very selfish. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> I put FNAF story down. So you can see that something bad's going to happen to Jessica and Br uh, Brittany, right? Um, they're very, very mean. And they try and make Mindy go and get them a spoon like a slave. You know, um, we're the popular girls. You do everything that we say. Go and get me a spoon. But Mindy and Cindy are very strong. Even when Jessica and Brittany are fully bullying them. Like, this is really harsh bullying. Very, very mean. But Mindy fights back and trolls them back and says they're just projecting. You're just projecting your anger and frustration at us, you know? Homecoming is coming up now, guys. Homecoming at the, at the school. And obviously, Jessica and Brittany are super excited for it because they're homecoming queen and princess for the year. But now the new one's coming up, they're going to be homecoming queen and princess again, right? Something's changed at the school where even the younger students can go to homecoming now. It's not just a one... It's not just that age group now going to homecoming it's the younger students now too and of course mindy and cindy have both agreed to go and it's really annoyed jessica and Brittany. you can see already there's a friction between jessica Brittany, and mindy and cindy so there's a, there's a tension between the two groups and that's obviously going to lead to something like revenge or something later on which leads to the juicy part of the story. They go to robotics class and annoyingly, Mindy and Cindy are both there as well uh, at the same class, which obviously increases the tension between them. And in robotics class, they usually get old donated animatronics to research and uh, toy with and change the programming with old robots. It's cheaper. It's cheaper, basically. Instead of buying new robots for the class, they get donated old ones. A shipment has just came in with a bunch of animatronic endoskeletons. In this big box, in this big crate, there's a bunch of mechanical animals of a cow, a horse, orangutan, a panther, and a huge pink pig. And this pig was life-size, so a massive animatronic that they got donated. It's never confirmed if all of these animals are from uh, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, um, but the pig definitely is. Um, so again, that's another new animatronic in the FNAF law, uh, in the Fazbear Frights law anyway. Like, it's not, it's not Pig Patch either. It's not Pig Patch. The pig was the closest to being fully dressed. It wore what looked like a frilly waitress uniform in a shade of pink, just a little darker than its fuzzy piggy skin. Atop its broad head sat a pillbox shaped pink cap with a ruffled edge. Other than the outfit and the fact that it had fuzzy pink hands instead of hooves, it looked a lot like a real pig. You'll partner up and each partnership will get one of these to work on. The project is in the class that each group gets an animatronic each, they fix it up and then you can program it however you want to perform a specific task. You show the programming towards the class, you know, program the cow animatronic, fix it up, make it activate, program it on the computer uh, to look to the ceiling and dance around a little bit and then you show it to the class afterwards the controls are connected to a computer or a laptop and you do the coding like sit down five seconds stand up 10 seconds sing 
50 seconds all in a, all in like coding and then you just press play and then the animatronic will do those with the timings and stuff right so everybody in the class gets sorted their animatronics and who do you think gets rosy pork chop jess and britney so jess and britney are the ones who have to deal with rosy pork chop the pig animatronic the biggest one out of the group now, because this animatronic is so big and heavy, Jessica and Brittany have to stay at school on the evenings to fix the animatronic and program it. They can't take it home like the other students because it's too big and heavy. It's not like the other animatronics. This is a big project. Jessica and Brittany have the amazing idea of programming Rosie to ruin Mindy and Cindy's homecoming, okay? You know, they start coming up with a fantasy. She's been programmed by us, of course, to walk right up to those two little twerps, knock them down, and sit on them. And it's just light-hearted. Make Rosie go crazy and knock them over or spill punch on them. They want Rosie to go to the homecoming event and, you know, knock Mindy and Cindy down, throw punch at them. Um, you know, and just embarrass them in front of everybody. That's it. Although it's still very, very mean, it's not dangerous, right? It's not like um, the programming Rosie to go and kill them. So that's their initial plan, guys. Just to troll around with Mindy and Cindy at homecoming using their new robot. This is what they notice when they get closer to Rosie and have a little inspection on what to do next. Expecting to see a full system of hydraulics and possibly a few baby pigs as a joke. Jessica raised her eyebrow when she saw that Rosie's belly was, for the most part, empty. A network of metal gears, prongs, and sharp-looking rods, presumably powered by hydraulics, lined the interior wall of the pig's belly, but the vast majority of the cavernous space was totally open, and big enough to hold a person, maybe two at most. So it's very similar to the sister location animatronics. There's an empty stomach that people get in, can climb into. This one's even more interesting, though. They find the instruction manual for Rosie Porkchop. Rosie Porkchop is a dual-purpose animatronic. The system can be engaged in traditional animatronic mode and also in human interface or suit mode, i.e. Rosie can be worn like a suit. Warning! Rosie Pork Chop contains spring locks. Spring locks engage to allow Rosie Pork Chop to function autonomously in animatronic mode. When engaged, metal components fill the entire interior of the animatronic. Rosie Pork Chop can also be worn as a suit. This is called human interface mode. When Rosie Pork Chop is in human interface mode, the spring locks disengage and retract into Rosie's endoskeleton. Do not switch modes while Rosie Porkchop is occupied. Sharp components of the spring lock system can cause serious bodily harm. So you can already see what is going to happen, right? This is the biggest indicator of the ending. Jessica and Brittany's new plan is to program Rosie to go to homecoming and take Mindy and Cindy and put them into the stomach. Not to kill them, not to spring lock the two girls just to capture them inside the stomach so they can't go to homecoming if that makes sense now i already instantly thought you know the story has already just warned us about the spring locks okay and do not change it to animatronic mode when somebody's in the suit something's gonna happen here somebody's gonna get spring locked right two girls who don't know much about programming at all are going to program a spring lock animatronic to go and capture mindy and cindy at homecoming Two people who can't program doing something like that. They didn't even read the instructions either uh, fully. But they're so angry about Mindy and Cindy. Those two little snots think they can come to homecoming dance. Well, they're coming all right, but not in their ruffled little dresses. They're going in her. And then points at Rosie Porkchop. So on the evening, they go back to school to go and program Rosie. And you already know, from the atmosphere of the description of the school, you already know something's going to happen. They're on their own. There's nobody else at the school apart from them. And they go inside the robotics class and seeing all of the creepy animatronics and stuff and seeing Rosie in the dark. You know, it's a FNAF story. You know something bad's going to happen. Brittany asks Jessica, like, do you know what you're doing? 
And Jessica just laughs about it. Probably not. How hard could it be? They plug Rosie into the laptop. The software program opens up. Um, and all you have to do on the software is just add the code. And then it tells Rosie what to do. Just make a list of all the commands we want to program into Rosie. And then we can assign the right numbers to them and input them. And then they start joking about when Mindy and Cindy are captured inside the suit. To make, uh, to make Rosie do tricks like spin, bow, roll over, play dead, like fetch stuff for them. They need to get Rosie to recognize Mindy and Cindy, you know, or it's not going to work. Rosie's going to go into homecoming dance and not know who to capture inside the suit. There is something called the Vercoda system. Vercoda system. And with this system... It allows Rosie to interpret spoken commands. Could also differentiate between the voices of adults and children. She was currently programmed to approach children and avoid adults. That's something that you can link back with Sister Location, right? The Sister Location animatronics must have had a similar system. They can, they know if somebody's a, a child or an adult. And obviously the Sister Location animatronics would have been programmed to go where the kids are. Jessica puts in the laptop, grab the kid command. They start putting in more and more commands after the grab the kid. So when Mindy and Cindy are captured inside Rosie, they want they want Rosie to do more commands for them to serve Brittany and Jessica while they're inside of the stomach. But while Rosie is, you know, serving them drinks and getting them food and stuff, Mindy and Cindy are going to be inside that stomach, and that's what they want. You know, they want to make a fool out of them. But that's a lot of commands inside that laptop now. Just so many commands for Rosie to do at this point. And this is a big indicator. Okay, well, I should probably start coding for Rosie to pick up the girls and put them in her belly. Then I'll do the commands for getting things and bringing them to us. But then Brittany points out at the commands. I think you got that backwards. Isn't that code for the kids, not the adults? Good eye, sorry, blonde moment. They looked at each other and laughed. Jessica is getting the commands mixed up already. So what do you think is going to happen? She's putting all these codes in saying, grab the kids. If she's got the coding wrong, Rosie could take anybody. Got to disconnect the command wire from Rosie and then plug her in and then activate Rosie. And then she should do the commands that she's been programmed to do, commanded to do. So let's see what happens when Rosie is activated. Go ahead and activate her, Jessica said to Brittany. Brittany grinned and reached behind Rosie's neck. She flipped a switch. As soon as she did, the cover to Rosie's control panel closed. With a click and a whir, Rosie blinked her eyes. Her head swiveled this way and that. Her gaze landed on Jessica. She blinked again and turned to look at Brittany. Another click sounded from inside Rosie and she rose up off the cart. Once she was off the cart, she stood still, looking at Brittany. What is she doing? Brittany asked. Jessica shook her head. Maybe she's just getting ready. She shoved her laptop back into her backpack and started to zip up the bag. Before Jessica could close her backpack, Rosie reached out and grabbed Brittany by the shoulders. Brittany screamed. Ah, what is she doing? Jessica turned towards Rosie and her friend and she stared in disbelief. Rosie's pink hands were full on clamped down on Brittany's right bicep. Brittany tried to wrench herself free of Rosie's grasp, but that just resulted in Rosie's metal fingers padded only by her pink felt digging in deeper. They cut through Brittany's bare skin drawing blood. Jessica watched in a horror as the blood trickled down to Brittany's elbow and dripped onto her shirt. Brittany cried out, Jessica, do something! Brittany tried to reach with her free arm to deactivate Rosie, but before she could, Rosie's hydraulic-driven strength yanked Brittany off her feet and twirled her upside down. Rosie's belly access door dropped open with a hiss, and Rosie lifted Brittany out and away from her belly so Brittany was hovering in the air, parallel to the floor. While Jessica was trying to figure out why Rosie was performing what looked like an acrobatic move, she hadn't programmed that. Rosie began shoving Brittany through the access door into Rosie's belly. Stop it! 
Jessica screamed at Rosie. She grabbed Brittany around the waist and tried to pull her out of the animatronic pig's grasp. What had gone wrong? Why was Rosie putting Brittany inside her stomach cavity? I'll carry on reading in a minute, but we all know why. The commands were wrong. Rosie's turned on and in her commands is grab kid. So Rosie's activated and saw Brittany and Jessica and gone, grab kid, shoving stomach. It's just programming what Jessica did. Rosie was relentlessly stuffing Brittany into her stomach. Jessica couldn't stop it. Brittany went into the belly cavity feet first and she didn't go quietly or easily. Kicking her legs madly, Brittany shrieked at the top of her lungs as she was stuffed into Rosie's open stomach. Between shrill screams, Brittany yelled, Turn her off! Turn her off! Jessica let go of Brittany's waist and tried grabbing Brittany's shoulders. But obviously, Brittany wasn't thinking clearly and she squirmed wildly. Jessica finally managed to get a grip on Brittany's upper arms, but she was no match for Rosie's strength. So Jessica tried to do what Brittany was now chanting. Turn her off, turn her off, turn her off. Jessica couldn't reach Rosie's control panel. Brittany's struggling torso and Rosie's relentless grasp blocked the way. Jessica ran around behind Rosie so she could get to the switch from the other side of the pig. Brittany kept screaming and fighting, just hang on, Jessica. I'll turn her off. Jessica reached for the pig's activation switch, but Rosie was significantly taller than the petite teen. Even on tiptoes, Jessica couldn't reach Rosie's neck. Brittany is still inside the stomach trying to get out, and Rosie is trying her best to shove her down into the stomach to close it. Jessica can't reach the switch as she goes to get a chair. She saw Brittany twist to try to pull herself out through the open access door. But not only did her body impede her reach, as soon as Rosie let go of Brittany's shoulders, Rosie got a grip on Brittany's head shoving her fingers through Brittany's tidy, slicked-back hair. Rosie clamped down onto Brittany's skull. Brittany's eyes goggled. They swiveled this way and that, looking for escape. Seeing Jessica, she gave her friend a beseeching look. Brittany's face was covered in sweat. Before Jessica could say anything to Brittany to try and reassure her, Rosie shoved Brittany's head inside of the stomach cavity. Brittany tried to turn and reach for the doorway, but before she could, it slammed shut with a sucking shh. It was sealed. Jessica stared her mouth hanging open. She then clamped a hand over her mouth. Her friend was trapped inside Rosie Porkchop. Brittany's okay. Uh, Brittany's still inside the stomach screaming for help. She's not dead. Uh, she's just inside the stomach cavity. So at this point, Rosie's just stood still now. And Jessica gets the chair, goes up to Rosie's neck, the control panel, and is looking around on how to deactivate Rosie to get her friend out. Doing all the con finding the controls, they're both talking to each other. Brittany's still inside the stomach saying, how long is it going to be? Get me out of here, please. So she's still alive. She's absolutely fine. Jessica fumbled around seeking the right button. Instead of a button, though, her fingers activated a toggle switch. Rosie Porkchop jolted so violently that she backed into Jessica's chair and tipped it over. Jessica tumbled to the ground, turning her ankle and whacking her head on the edge of a nearby table. Crap! She snapped, rubbing her head. Then she turned to look at Rosie. She blinked in confusion. Rosie was convulsing. And from inside Rosie, Brittany let out a sound that Jessica had never heard before and never wanted to hear again. It sounded like a cross between a howl and a screech. It was loud. It didn't sound muffled at all. And it quite clearly was the sound of excruciating pain. Before Jessica could even react to her friend's cries, they stopped. Rosie was perfectly still. Oh my God, Jessica shouted, struggling to her feet. Brittany, can you hear me? Jessica started to pant in total panic. What had happened to Brittany? Rosie went still. Jessica peered at the controls. Oh, she flipped the mode switch from suit to animatronic. Sorry, she muttered. She quickly flipped the switch back to suit. As soon as the switch was moved, Rosie's belly access door popped open. Yes! Jessica punched the air. She rushed around to help her friend out of the animatronic pig. When she stepped to the belly side of the pig, 
the first thing Jessica noticed was that the interior of the access door wasn't the silver grey it had been when she last seen it. It also wasn't dry. It was... Is that blood? As Jessica watched, a thick red drop detached from the edge of the door and plopped onto the grey rubber flooring. She gaped at it. The hairs on her back neck stood up. Her brain was suddenly sluggish. She was having trouble processing what the blood meant. The blood and the fact that Brittany wasn't clambering to get out of the pig was telling her something, something she didn't want to know. Jessica blinked then leaned towards the door, ready to help Brittany out. Brittany? Jessica tried to see inside Rosie, but she couldn't. She could, however, see a scrap of denim stuck on a gear near the door cover. A bloody scrap. Brittany has got spring locked. And Brittany's dead. Now you think that's the worst of it, right? That's the worst of Together Forever. That's it. The end. Her friend dies and it's a big mistake. It's an accident. It doesn't end there, guys. It gets worse. In the minutes that followed, she'd have a few seconds in which she wondered if her sudden movement was what reactivated Rosie. Would Rosie have stayed frozen if Jessica had slunk off the chair and retreated slowly, stealthily, out of the classroom? She would never know, because that's not what she did. She made a loud noise and she moved suddenly. Rosie's reaction was instantaneous. She reached out and she grabbed Jessica by the shoulders. In, in an, in an, in an, I can't read. In an identical move to the one she used on Brittany, Rosie flipped Jessica upside down and then lifted her into a position parallel to the floor. Jessica screamed and started flailing around. She pounded on the pig's hands. Let me go! Jessica screeched. Then she just started crying out for help. Help me! She screamed at the top of her lungs, even though she knew she was alone. As Jessica fought against Rosie, part of her mind, the part that was still capable of logical thought, tried to figure out what she had done to make the pig grab Brittany and now her. How had she gotten the programming so wrong? She had been typing in the name codes when she had seen the robotic rat. Right in the middle of that process, Jessica had left what she was doing. When she had gotten back to the computer, she must have flipped the codes. She had gotten the commands reversed. Whatever she had programmed Rosie to do to Cindy and Mindy, Rosie would do to Jessica and Brittany, and Jessica and Brittany would be forced to serve Cindy and Mindy. So instead of Mindy and Cindy getting shoved into Rosie, it's reversed. They got the, they got the coding wrong. So Rosie was programmed all along when activated to take Jessica and Brittany instead. And then to serve Mindy and Cindy afterwards and do everything that Mindy and Cindy ask Rosie to do. Jessica tried really, really hard to escape Rosie's grasp, but it's not working. Um, she's getting shoved into the stomach. As Jessica was crammed into Rosie's belly, she tried to grab onto Rosie's interior, hoping it would stop her forward progress. When she did, though, her hand slipped off slimy wetness. Jessica gagged and scrabbled for something to grasp, something that would help her dis disengage from Rosie's determined clench, but her hands couldn't find anything to help her. They just found more squishy warmth, all that now remained of her friend. So even worse, she's trying to escape Rosie's belly, clinging onto things, and it's the flesh of her best friend making her slip off the grip and stuff. So... <laughs> Not good. Rosie gave Jessica one final shove, and Jessica felt the top of her head rubbing on the access door opening. She turned her head to try and see out the opening, and that's when she saw. Jessica shrieked again and retched. She closed her eyes tight, trying not to let her brain replay what she had seen. Brittany wasn't even remotely Brittany anymore. She was just a churned up mass of skin, locks of blonde hair, bits of bone, nauseatingly gleaming white tissue, and chunks of minced organs. It looked like Brittany had been pulverised and smeared all over the inside of Rosie's belly. What was left of Brittany was entangled in Rosie's mechanisms, the gears and prongs and rods that were now drawn back against the walls of Rosie's stomach. So Jessica 
going inside Rose's belly is now surrounded by Britney's remains. And that was a very, very gruesome detail on how destroyed Britney is. It's not Britney anymore. The book says it's not Britney anymore. There's no corpse. A mashed up Britney because of the spring locks. Jessica forced herself to open her eyes. And as soon as she did, she thought she could see jagged shards that her brain told her were pieces of Britney's bones. She refused to listen to her brain. She couldn't. If she let herself actually acknowledge that she was being crammed into a lethal chamber that had already chewed up her friend, she would lose what was left of her mind. She had to stay focused if she was going to figure out a way to get out free. Jessica swallowed down bile, gritted her teeth, and started feeling around the interior of Rosie's belly. There had to be some mechanism that would free her. No matter how much she searched though, Jessica's fingers found little besides gross, stomach churning, wet sponginess. At one point, she closed her fist around what she knew in instantaneously was a piece of Britney's intestines. As soon as the pulpy mass collapsed in her fingers, Rose's interior was filled with an abominable smell, worse than any nastiness some skank might have left in a public toilet. This is very descriptive. Jessica's stomach flipped over in a dry heave. She opened her hand, shifted it and tried again. This time she got a hold of one of the sharp rods that were part of Rose's hydraulic system. She felt blood trickle from her knuckle and wind its way down to the back of her hand. Plastered to the other side of the animatronic stomach was Britney's face, looking like it had been peeled from her head and hung on one of the prongs that was now retracted against the inner wall. Still retaining its form and with its bright blue eyes still in their sockets, Britney's face was a grisly mask. The mask was bloody at the edges, but otherwise it looked unscathed by the destruction. Rose's system had, re had reeked on Britney's body. Britney's irises were where they should have been. Her nose held its proper shape and her new lip gloss, bizarrely, was still in place. Jessica gaped at the face, unable to look away until the belly access door slammed shut with a very, very loud whoosh and a reverberating clank. Then all she could see was darkness. So now Jessica is fully inside of the stomach and the stomach catch has closed and she can't really see anything. It's really dark. Jessica's, Jessica's shriek caught in her throat and she started to choke. Or was that something else in her throat? Oh God, it was. Something had dripped off Rosie's mechanisms and fallen down inside Jessica's mouth. She was pretty sure she had just swallowed a piece of Britney's skin. This is the important thing now. Jessica? Jessica froze. Hello? Is someone out there? I'm inside here. Inside the pig. Get me out of here. She tried to pound on the inside of Rosie's belly, but she again encountered gears and rods. And she also, yet again felt way too many of Britney's squidgy body parts. She stilled her hands and listened. Help me, Jessica, the voice said. Help her? What stupid girl wanted Jessica's help? It was Jessica who needed the help. Jessica opened her mouth to yell at whoever was talking, but then she stopped. Wait a second, she thought. That voice, it hadn't come from outside Rosie. Jessica? I think we might have screwed up, the voice said. Jessica's breathing caught. It was Brittany. That was Brittany's voice. She wasn't dead? How is that possible? Brit? Jessica whispered. Jessica, Brittany answered. I'm glad you're here. I'm cold. She wasn't dead? How was she not dead? Jessica had not taken an inventory of Brittany's parts. There was no way Brittany could be alive. No way, Jessica said out loud. For sure, right? Brittany said. Jessica shifted her hips to try and stop a rod from pressing against her foot. She made herself breathe in and out evenly through her mouth. She wasn't going to use her nose again. Okay, so if Brittany was dead, then why was she hearing Brittany's voice? Just as Jessica had the thought, she heard a click. She sucked in her breath. The switch. No, no. Not the... In the briefest of instants, 
Jessica went from thought to nothing but sensation, and the sensation was worse than any pain imaginable. Every nerve, every nerve ending in her body registered a catastrophic, lethal attack, and then nothing. Jessica's consciousness was only darkness. No poise, no grace, no presence, no royalty here, nothing but blackness. Jessica dies as well. Jessica gets spring locked. Um, it's never said how the animatronic switch was flipped. Did somebody else do it? Was it an automatic programming for Rosie to do? We, we never find out. It was probably going to happen anyway. So yeah, they both they both get spring-locked, guys. It's as simple as that. Um, but the, the this that part goes in so much detail about Britney's corpse and Jessica going around the stomach looking around for help, uh, feeling all the remains of her best friend and then seeing her face, her skin, the mask of her face attached to one of the rods on the wall of the stomach. Imagine seeing that. Jessica getting spring-locked as well and saying it's the worst pain ever imaginable and then dying. Something else pretty crazy is that Britney's voice was inside of the stomach when she was dead, which means Britney's soul was still inside the suit at that point and Jessica could hear her talking to her. And then the next day, Mindy and Cindy go into the robotics class, you know, to show their little animatronic presentation what they've been working on. And Rosie is still there. And what do you think Rosie does when she sees Mindy and Cindy? When they entered the room, the first thing Mindy and Cindy saw was Rosie Porkchop. The animatronic pig stood a few feet away from the door, watching them with a happy smile. The pig's curly tail whirred in a spiral. Hi, Rosie, Mindy said. Rosie raised her right arm. Both girls stared at her. Cindy tilted her head. I think she wants to give you a high five. Mindy laughed and slapped the pig's hand. Rosie stood, spun in a circle, bowed and said, Hello, Mindy. Mindy raised her eyebrows. How does she know your name? Cindy asked. Mindy shook her head. I don't know. She looked around. Do you think Mr. Fortin programmed her with all of our names? Shifting the animatronic dog that she held, she poked Cindy. You try and say hello. Cindy shrugged. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Cindy. Cindy laughed. Rosie's voice sounded familiar. Hey, Cindy said. Doesn't she sound a little bit like that mean girl? Which one? Mindy asked. She and Cindy had encountered more than a few mean girls at school. The ones who were going to be homecoming queen, Cindy said. Brittany? Oh, that one. No, the queen is Jessica. The princess is Brittany. Mindy looked at Rosie. Did Rosie sound like Jessica? She decided to see if Rosie would say something else. What are you doing here, Rosie? She asked. I'm here to serve you and Cindy, Rosie said in Jessica's smooth voice. Wow, Mindy grinned. She turned to Cindy. You're right. It is her voice. You know, Rosie's been programmed to serve Mindy and Cindy because the programming was wrong. It was supposed to be the opposite. But Rosie, you know, is serving Mindy and Cindy now. Which is so ironic because inside of that suit are the corpses of Jessica and Brittany, but they don't know. But what's weirder is that Rosie has Jessica's voice now. I instantly thought of Circus Baby slash Ennard. Ennard in the private room uses um, Elizabeth's voice, little kid's voice, who got killed inside the suit because Elizabeth is possessing baby, right? So then Mr. Fortin comes into the class and sees uh, Mindy and Cindy with Rosie and he has to check something. So he knelt next to Rosie's neck and flipped a switch. Nothing happened. He reached under the belly, felt around and gave a tug. Nothing happened. He straightened. Good. Apparently, it's been deactivated. What has? Mindy asked. Mr. Fortin waved a hand as if the topic was not important. Oh, I saw an article last night about the old spring lock suits, part animatronic and part costume. This was one of them. They were taken out of commission because they were deemed too dangerous for use. 
Apparently, sometimes these old animatronics switched modes automatically because of a glitch in the programming. He patted Rosie's big pink head. But she seems safe enough now, and clearly you've done a great job reprogramming her. Even though Mindy and Cindy didn't do anything. And then uh, Mindy says, thanks Rosie. Uh, they've took the credit as well for Jessica and Brittany's work. Uh, and pretended that they've done the programming when they haven't. And this is the ending line, guys. Inside Rosie, fused with the interlocking metal structure of the machine's mechanisms, two lifeless, disembodied faces stared at each other. Although the lips on both faces had perfectly applied shiny lip gloss, the mouths guarded by that gloss would never speak again. The two faces would stare at each other in perpetual silence, their features locked in contorted expressions of horrified understanding. The end. So unfortunately, guys, the teacher doesn't even see anything either. Uh, there's no evidence that something bad has happened. There's no blood or anything on the floor after the spring locks. It's all still inside the stomach. Uh, no evidence. So when Rose, when Mindy and Cindy go in and when the teacher goes in, there's no sign of anything bad ha happening it's it's fine and it's so ironic that the teacher goes to check the suit and then you know nothing happens flips the switch and a spring lock doesn't work he, he, he presses a he pulls something under the stomach and nothing happens um which is really weird because it happened last night the animatronic suit mode worked last night so why doesn't it work now um FNAF guys, FNAF story. This, I think the suit did have something like agony inside of it or Eleanor programmed it uh, to do that to them or something like that, you know. Now you've really got to think like, if that's one of the stomachs of the Springlock suits, like how horrifying the sister location stomachs can be now that we know this can happen. We've counted the ways, we kind of got that with Funtime Freddy's stomach, like, you know, Funtime Freddy can do a lot more than we thought inside of his stomach um, to kill his victims, but this one, with the animatronic suit mode and stuff, I didn't really want to skip the main parts of the story, so there was a lot to read at that end part. Uh, I just wanted to show you guys, like, how, how gruesome this story is, man. How, it's really bad. <laughs> um, probably the most gruesome story out of all of the books, I would say. We've got the end part with the Stitch Wraith and Eleanor and Detective Larson. So if you remember, a uh, quick, quick recap, quick, quick short recap of the last epilogue. Um, Detective Larson gets the blood samples back from the, uh, from the ball pit, the same pit into the pit of the first story inside that location. All of the blood samples are of the same, the same blood, but they're from loads of different timelines loads of different dates but it's the same blood we also have stitch rife and renell stitch rife meets a girl called renell um very similar to eleanor the name sounds so similar to eleanor and stitch rife is basically looking after her at the time being okay so let's see what happens we start off with detective larson and he's trying to research the ball pit building like where did this building originate from like who owns it uh, let's do some research and it's difficult to find out who owns it, apparently. There's been a lot of owners of that uh, location, apparently, and it's failed a lot all the time. Now, this is an important part. The blood samples of the pit coincide with the missing person incidents. The Fazbear Fright ones, not the missing kids. The Fazbear Fright incidents. The date when Sarah went missing in To Be Beautiful is one of the blood sample dates. So all of the missing people in the Fazbear Fright stories uh, have the same dates as the blood samples, which is really interesting. So it's the blood of the same person, the DNA apparently, but all of the dates are different. All of the samples dates are different, but they all coincide with the missing teenagers in the Fazbear Fright universe. And he looks at the photos of the missing teens and on one, of the teen photos in the background is Eleanor. So Eleanor is in the background on one of these photos, still wearing the heart-shaped pendant. At this point, guys, Eleanor is a lot more important than we thought, right? We knew that anyway after 
She escaped Afton and Afton died. Like, we knew, like, you know, Eleanor's coming back. He mentions a scientist called Dr. Talbot who's been lingering around the case and stuff who specializes in something called Remnant. So, Dr. Talbot has been researching Remnant, okay? This isn't William Afton, by the way. This is a, this is a researcher, a scientist who's been trying to research, you know, what's been going on with, with what's been going on with these incidents and more importantly, Remnant. Again, Larson thinks about Stitch Rafe. He says, like, I need to find Stitch Rafe. You know, he must, he must know something at least. Now, this is when it all combines together uh, with a nice cliffhanger for the last book. Stitch Rafe slash Jake has found Rennell's father, apparently. Jake has this power to look into people's heads and memories and stuff. Kind of like what he did with the homeless man, if you remember, Grim, uh, to try and make him fall asleep. So Jake has these powers to remember remember things and find memories and stuff. With Rennell's memories, they were disjointed and unclear. Very suspicious, right? But Jake just plays it off like, oh, it's probably all the drugs that rennell has been taking. Uh, you know, he's probably messed with her brain. Even Jake senses that Rennell has another name. So instantly then I was like, Jake, Rennell is Eleanor. She is using the heart-shaped pendant to make you think she looks like that, but it's not her. Rennell is Eleanor. And you know what the heart-shaped pendant is. Uh, even from the previous books of the fourth closet and the twisted ones, it's an illusion disc. It's an illusion disc. And... Jake's getting the illusion that he can see a sad homeless girl uh, when in fact it's Eleanor. When, when Rennell's there, Rennell's putting her hair into pigtails, just like Eleanor. So yeah, Jake Jake says to Rennell, like, I, fe I know where your dad lives, let's go, you know, let's do it. Instead of Rennell, like, resisting, she just goes, okay, let's go. Why would she be so interested in going to Dr. Talbot's house? They walk inside the house. Dr. Talbot's in the other room at the moment. He thinks he's got a delivery, so he's in the other room saying, wait a sec, I'll be there in a minute. Stitch Rave is looking at the wall of photographs, right? This is a wall of photographs. And in one of the photos is two men wearing lab coats. The first doctor, Dr. Talbot, is there. The second man, Dr. Taggart, right? That's the first doctor. Do you remember a few books ago? That's his friend who got killed by Stitch Rafe, a.k.a. the angry spirit inside Stitch Rafe, Andrew, who's gone now. Which I thought was a nice little reference back to Dr. Taggart. And he, he as well was researching stuff too. So I think they were both trying to research what was going on. Dr. Talbot was researching Remnant. And Dr. Taggart was researching the en energy of agony and how uh, items and animatronics can get possessed with agony and stuff like that. There was another photo on the wall. And it's a photo of Dr. Talbot very happy with a little girl, his daughter. Dr. Talbot's daughter had black curly hair and Dr. Talbot's daughter looked nothing like Rennell. Nothing like her. So that's already a big, oh my God. Rennell is not Dr. Talbot's daughter. What is going on? Why does Rennell want to be here? Remember that Larson, Detective Larson, wants to talk to Dr. Talbot as well, right? So ironically, Larson arrives at the house the same time Stitch Rafe and Rennell are there. Now I'm going to read this last part to you guys because it's really, really good. Um, and it sets up to the last, the last, the ending of it, which is really cool. He stepped into the foyer and stood frozen, unable to believe what was in front of him. There was the familiar white face with sunken black eyes, the endoskeleton body, the Stitch Rafe. Standing next to it was a young girl with unwashed hair braided into pigtails. Her clothes were worn and dirty. She was otherwise normal. Larson can see Rennell as well, looking absolutely fine, nothing wrong. But what happened next was anything but normal. The girl was staring at a photo of a younger girl, a preteen with curly black hair. And then suddenly she was that girl, small, 
black-haired, adorable, and innocent-looking. When Stitch Ripe was looking at the photo of Dr. Talbot and his daughter, Rennell was looking at it as well. And what does she do? She uses her illusion disc to turn into Dr. Talbot's daughter. Larson felt his insides turn to jelly. It was happening. Another one of his visions. He felt himself sinking into it, quicksand-like. He was unable to lift himself out, no matter how badly he wanted to. As he stared at the newly transformed girl, the mask she had created for herself fell away. He no longer saw the smiling face of a curly-haired child, but another face that was all too familiar. The sickly skull-like shape, the painted pink circle cheeks, the red mouth with its twisted teeth, the heart-shaped pendant which appeared to pulse and throb. It was her from the picture, the clown peeking over the disappeared girl's shoulder. Out of nowhere, a name popped into his head, Eleanor. Uh, we think because of him being stabbed by um, stabbed by Afton, afterwards he gets these visions and he keeps going back into trances. Uh, like the first one he did, he saw the ball pit in a vision. Um, he's starting to get another one now as well. And that leads to something crazy. And I feel like that helps him see Eleanor. He could see her, but he could see into her too. And what he saw was a black, chaotic force that fed on human suffering. The fear, the pain, the death. She, not the Stitch Wraith, was the cause of it. In both his head and his heart, Larson knew this to be true. He was surer of it than he had been of anything in his life. He was so sure that he drew his gun and took aim. The girl's eyes met his. She smiled. The room fell away, as did everything familiar. Larson's eyelids fluttered then shut, and he fell to the floor with a thud. Eleanor, he whispered before he lost consciousness. So now at this point, guys, Detective Larson knows that it's Eleanor. Eleanor is the cause of everything. Not Stitch Rave. Stitch Rave's innocent, and Stitch Rave saved him. But everything that has happened in all of these books is Eleanor. Not Afton, not William Afton, Eleanor. Eleanor is the root of everything that's happened in all of these stories. It's Eleanor, and he knows that now. But before he can do anything, he goes into his trance, and he goes into his dreamlike state. Now, this part's really cool. Um, you can imagine this in a movie. Basically, Larson goes into a, 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 a dreamlike state. Uh, if you've ever watched Insidious, kind of like the fervor, he's there... Um, watching things happen in front of his eyes of the past in like a, a, a weird void state. It was dark, but there was an eerie glow, as if a neon sign was shining from outside a window, but there were no windows. There was nothing, a void. Larson blinked hard, trying to adjust his eyesight. Then he saw her just a few feet ahead of him. She was standing in front of a table. Her back was turned but her identity was unmistakable. The red pigtails, the long neck, the curves of the robotic body. He stepped closer. He's unconscious at this point, guys, but he's getting visions of Eleanor and what she's been up to. She was working on something so intently, she didn't seem to notice him behind her. He drew nearer. The object that was taking up all her attention was a hideous plush toy. Its long ears suggested it was a rabbit, though it was certainly the least cute stuffed bunny Larson had ever seen. And what in the world was she doing to it? With one hand, she held its jaws open wider than seemed possible. With the other, she was shoving something into its mouth, something that made an unpleasant squishy sound as she pressed it down. This is plush trap, guys. This is out of stock. This is the plush trap that had the human organs inside of it. Stepping a bit closer, Larson saw it was a tooth. One in a row of bloody human teeth that occupied the thing's lower jaw. Its eyes, Larson noticed, were wet looking. Their white streaked with red blood vessels. Human eyes. It felt like they were staring at him. The clown girl laughed, turned around to face him, then was gone. Larson felt the floor upturn beneath him. It tilted so far that he started sliding backwards. He struggled to find his balance. 
Once he got his footing and the floor beneath him felt level again, he looked around to see that he was in a room, though an unfamiliar one. It was a small, modest living room. An ugly handmade afghan was draped over the couch. On the coffee table was a glass about one four full of milk and a saucer with cookie crumbs on it. Where was he? He looked around trying to orient himself. The digital clock on the stove in the kitchen announced the time as 1.35 a.m. There was a sound of frantic scratching like there was an animal trapped behind the closed door of the other room. A little apprehensively, Larson opened it to let out the cat or dog. But there was no cat or dog and the scratching continued insist insistently from inside the room. Larson stood in the doorway and peeked inside. The scratching was coming from outside the window. Framed in a window was the clown-like face with the circled cheeks and red grin. She was clawing at the window with her metal fingertips. In the bed, a young woman sat up clutching the covers, her eyes wide with terror. You need to get out of here, Larson said to the woman. You're in danger. She didn't look in his direction didn't seem able to see or hear him. Instead, she looked around frantically without stopping to rest her gaze on either Larson or the murderous creature in the window, muttering, it's the doll, it's the doll, it's the doll. The floor rose up again, the bedroom fell away, and Larson felt himself falling too. So what's happening to Larson, guys, is that he's going back to all the events of the missing teens. In all of these scenarios, Eleanor is there. Eleanor made the human plush trap. Eleanor was the one making the noise, tormenting, tormenting the 1.35 a.m. lady. Thinking that it was the doll, it was Eleanor making all of those noises in her apartment. It wasn't the doll. Which then obviously leads the 1.35 a.m. lady to go crazy and die and get stuck in a vent. It was Eleanor all along all of these. And it's not finished yet, guys. It's still going. I'm reading a lot today. Oh, my God. He was standing in the doorway of an operating room. Two men in surgical scrubs stood over a table on which a motionless young boy was trapped. His eyes were open and wide and stayed open even after one of the surgeons tried to close them. Behind the boy's head, holding him down by the shoulders, was the smiling clown girl. One of the surgeons turned on a small buzzsaw that whirred menacingly. Somehow, Larson knew that this surgery wasn't going to save the boy. Instead, it was something the boy needed saving from. It was Eleanor who was putting him in danger. Larson burst into the room, prepared to save the boy if he could. But when Larson reached the operating table, the boy wasn't there. The surgeons were gone, and on the table was a man, or what was left of a man. So that was Step Closer, guys. That was the boy in Step Closer who gets surgery, uh, who gets surgery from the surgeons. Again, it was Eleanor all along. When he goes into the surgery room, the boy's gone. But there is something there on the table. The body appeared to have been burnt almost beyond recognition. This is Afton now. Hairless, faceless, almost skinless, except for the translucent layer through which the pulsing of his organs was visible. As Larson breathed in at the shocking sight, his nose filled with the sickly smell of charred flesh, sweet, meaty, and acrid all at the same time. He retched and took a step back. This, this is the man in room 1280. As he tried to recover, Larson became aware of a sound, a rustling, a whisper, that seemed to be coming from the man's body. The man's lipless mouth did not move. The sound seemed to be coming from within his chest. Larson leaned down to listen right above the man's visible beating heart. A pair of metal hands gripped Larson's shoulders and a familiar face burst from the burned man's body cavity. The pink cheek circles were made of the man's tissue. The mouth and teeth were red with blood. The strong metal hands dragged Larson inside the burned man's body. There was only darkness. He tried to feel what was around him but only grasped air. Then there was a whooshing sound, and he was standing at the entrance of a maze lit by black light. It was clearly some kind of kid's game. There was colourful cutouts of buildings like a school and a firehouse, but someone must have gotten rough with the game. 
because some of the cutouts had been knocked down and patches were all on the walls to repair damage. So this is the hide and seek story. And there she was, Eleanor, in the middle of the maze like a minotaur, winking and giving a jaunty little wave before she took off at a run. He chased her, but he was a man, not a machine, and he was physically and mentally exhausted. He wasn't sure how long he could keep up the chase. He made a left, then a right, then another right, trying to remember the directions in case he got lost and needed to backtrack. His eyes ached from the harshness of the black light. Larson made another right and ran into a boy. Well, the body of a boy. The boy was hanging from the wall with wooden pegs driven through his back. A puddle of blood had gathered on the floor below his sneakers. Larson felt he might be sick again. He turned his head from the upsetting sight and saw Eleanor leaning in the doorway, smiling as if she were looking on a happy scene. For some reason, the dead boy was smiling too, as if he and the clown girl were sharing a private joke. The floor flipped up like a trap door. Larson fell hard and was surprised to feel grass and dirt beneath him. It was dark and the air was cool and breezy. Outside, he was outside, but where? He stood and tried to shake off his disorientation. He was standing a few feet away from a railroad track. A figure was visible, standing on the tracks. He moved closer. Wait, there were two figures. One was the horrible monstrosity he had been chasing in whatever alternate reality or break with reality he was experiencing. The other, held in the arms of the first, was a kid in some kind of costume. Eleanor spun him around, no doubt making him dizzy and disoriented. The kid struggled and fought, kicking his long legs. Was he dressed as a bird? But he was tangled in his costume and couldn't get himself free. In the distance, Larson heard the whistle of a train. This is Blackbird, by the way. This is the Blackbird costume. Eleanor was clinging on to the boy in the costume, Blackbird, on the train tracks, disorienting, making him dizzy, spinning him around, making him trapped on the railroad. So again, it was Eleanor all along. Eleanor cannot be seen. Eleanor using the pendant cannot be seen. In the distance, Larson heard the whistle of a train. He ran to the tracks. Eleanor turned her head and locked eyes with Larson. She let go of her victim, jumped up and took off across a nearby field. The kid in the strange bird costume was still on the tracks, tangled in his weird bird suit and disoriented. Larson pushed him off the tracks. He landed in a ditch, but at least he wasn't in the path of the train. Did Larson save him? You know how he was found in a ditch in the Blackbird story and survived the train accident? Was that because Larson saved him? This is when things get confusing, right? So was Larson actually there at that point? Did Larson really save the boy in the Blackbird costume? Larson waited while the train roared past, then started running across the field where Eleanor had headed. But soon it was apparent that it was too late. She was gone. Larson stood in the dark field, unsure of where he was or when it was. And then it stops there, guys, and it goes back to Jake slash Stitch Wraith in Dr. Talbot's room with Ronell. Jake looked over at the creature he could only think of as not Ronell. Then he looked down at the body of the police officer, Larson, he had once saved. The guy had just wandered into the house and passed out, hitting his head on the floor and whispering the name Eleanor. Too many weird things were happening all at once. Ronell! cried the same booming voice that had called out when the front door had opened. Jake turned again and watched the bushy-haired man from the photo rush towards Ronell. Dr. Talbot wrapped his arms around his fake daughter and squeezed her hand. Tears streamed down his lined face. I'm so happy you're home. I thought I'd lost you forever. The doctor was so focused on the girl in his arms that he didn't even look at Jake, but the girl did. Not Ronell looked directly at Jake and she winked. Eleanor, Jake said. Eleanor grinned. The grin was even more triumphant than the wink. So Eleanor's like, yeah, I've won. Look, he can, 
He thinks that I'm his lost daughter. Like, I'm winning here. But Jake's had enough at this point, guys. Jake knows it's Eleanor and lunges towards Eleanor and then they have a big fight. Jake knew now that he had been right. This thing, Eleanor, not the man named Afton, had been the thing powering the giant monster. Afton, while unimaginably evil, had been too weak at the time. Eleanor had given him his last burst of strength, but he failed and she escaped. And now she had tricked Jake into bringing her here for some reason. What did she want from him? Whatever her reasons for bringing him here, they couldn't be good. Jake figured if he attacked her before she saw it coming, he might be able to stop whatever it was she was planning. But he hadn't counted on how clever and manipulative she was. So Jake didn't really do anything bad. Jake just shoved her onto some shelves, right? Eleanor screams and has a stab wound in her belly. So Dr. Talbot sees this big endoskeleton stitch wraith attack his daughter. And his daughter now has a stab wound in her stomach. Jake didn't do that, by the way. Eleanor did. What does Dr. Talbot do? He gets his gun and starts shooting Stitch Wraith. And unfortunately, one of the shots fired at him shoots his battery. And Jake crumpled to the floor. The energy sucked out of him. His battery's been shot. He slumps to the floor. He can't do anything. He's got no power. As soon as Jake was down, Dr. Talbot rushed to his daughter. I'll be right back, Ronell, he said. He left the room and quickly reappeared, pushing a rolling metal table. He picked her up effortlessly and laid her on it. Hang on, Ronell, he said. I can save you. Remnant will save you. Jake couldn't move, but he could hear and see. He wanted, with all of his will, to say, That's not your daughter. But he couldn't speak. As soon as Dr. Talbot said, Remnant, Eleanor smiled. She wanted Remnant. That was why she had tricked Jake into bringing her here. But what was Remnant? And why did she want it? Flashes of the memories he felt when he was near her gave him glimpses into its nature. He couldn't hear her thoughts exactly, but he could feel the words, power, life, eternal. The doctor put a pillow under Eleanor's head and said, just relax, I'll be right back. He ran from the room, then returned with a rolling metal tray containing beakers of bubbling thick silver liquid. He pulled the tray up next to the table. That's Remnant, by the way. While Eleanor looked at the liquid and smiled widely, Dr. Talbot took out his phone and punched in a number. Security? I've had a break in. Thank you. Yes, now. Dr. Talbot glanced at Jake. He had not seemed to notice the unconscious man on the floor. Eleanor gazed at the bubbling liquid as if it was the most precious thing in the world. Jake couldn't move. All he could do was watch Dr. Talbot begin hooking up the tubing to the containers of the liquid substance. Dr. Talbot glanced at Jake one more time. Then he prepared an IV to transfer the liquid into the thing he thought was his daughter. Jake tried to will himself to move, but will without physical power was useless. The detective's eyelids fluttered and he mumbled something incoherent, but he did not regain consciousness. Eleanor locked eyes with Jake. She was still smiling. Of course she's smiling, Jake thought. She won. Something was changing. Eleanor's human disguise was disintegrating. The dark, curly hair fell from her scalp, but disappeared before it hit the floor. The healthy-looking, pink-tinged flesh of her face melted away to reveal a thin layer of sickly grey skin. Dr. Talbot drew back in horror. Eleanor's huge dead eyes bulged, and her red-stained mouth gaped, revealing the vicious zigzag of her teeth. She looked at Jake, her eyes pulsating, her unhinged jaw opening wide. Epilogue end. So it's left on a cliffhanger for the next part, guys, where Eleanor is in full power now. She was already powerful as it is, but she tricked Jake into taking her to Dr. Talbot's home because she's mimicking to be Rennell. 
sees the photo of the younger version of Ronell, turns into her, and then Dr. Talbot's obviously seeing her, you know, oh my God, my daughter's back. Where have you been? Oh my God, my daughter. Obviously not thinking straight. If you walk into a room and you see your daughter back, even as a young girl, uh, when she shouldn't be there, she shouldn't look like that, she, she should be a lot older, you'd have the same reaction as Dr. Talbot, you know, the first reaction, like, oh my God, my daughter's back. Because of the illusion disc, um, Eleanor's uh, heart-shaped pendant, the illusion disc, Dr. Talbot gets the remnant in um, and injects her with the remnant, and then she gets even more powerful. Her plan all along is to get stronger with agony and remnant, most of the incidents in the Fazbear Fright stories, some of them are just like, some of them have no deaths and some of them are just nice stories. But most of the incidents, most of the deaths that happen, Eleanor's doings, Eleanor did all those. And I think it will, I think it will explain the ball pit in the next part. The ball pit must be a storage where all of the people who died by Eleanor are all trapped in there or something. That would explain the... That would explain the, the dates being the same as the missing incidents. I feel like the ball pit is just some powerful thing that stores all of the agony um, for Eleanor or something. I don't know. Hopefully, the ball pit gets explained in the last part. Hopefully. We'll have to wait and see. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts. I feel like that was a really good cliffhanger. I had When I was reading that, I had it all imagined in my brain of Eleanor smiling and, you know, thinking she's worn getting injected with Remnant, getting stronger. What's going to happen? The next book is Prankster. Uh, and that's got the last three stories and the finale of the epilogue of Stitch Rife and Eleanor and Detective Larson. So we'll have to wait and see. Take care, lots of love, thanks for watching. And I'll see you all next time.